Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our next session in the NCHV conference. My name is Cindy Borden. You may have seen me earlier in the opening remarks, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Today's session is about promoting employment and job quality, and I am so thrilled to have our two panelists today. Um, really excited to have both of them here. We first will hear from Amy Blair. Amy is the research director for the Economic Opportunities Program at the Aspen Institute. Um, she leads projects designed to promote learning about highly promising workforce development and job quality strategies implemented by a range of types of organizations. Amy's work focuses on research to identify and explore innovative and emerging new practices and strategies and is geared toward program capacity building and field building. So welcome, Amy. We're thrilled to have you. And second, um, we have Chris Warland. Chris is the Associate Director for Field, build, field Building at Heartland Alliance's National Initiatives on Poverty and Economic Opportunity. He supports employment for chronically unemployed people across the country by developing resources, offering trainings, facilitating peer learning, and consulting with employment initiatives at the local, state, and federal levels. Uh, before getting involved in workforce development, Chris worked for several years as an adult education teacher for detainees at the Cook County Jail. So welcome both Amy and Chris. As I said, I'm thrilled to have you. Um, this session is a really, um, uh, great uh, follow-up to some of the conversations that were had in the opening session this morning about the economic opportunities that are essential for ending veteran homelessness. So we're thrilled to have you. And with that, I am going to pass things on to Amy to get things started. So thank you so much, Cindy, for that really nice introduction. Um, I'm really um, excited to be here with everybody today. Um, just um, very honored to be invited to the conference and to be to, to participate with you. Um, particularly, I'm thrilled to be with you all because I come from a military family. Um, so the issue of economic opportunity for homeless veterans is uh, very personal for me. Um, in the next half hour or so, maybe a little less, we'll be talking. I'll be talking about job quality. It sounds like Chris is too. Um, why it's important, what it is, and um, and I'm going to get into some practical steps that people can take from different lanes of work. Um, in, in your work. Um, I'm going to start by sharing a little bit of data to provide some context um, and then introduce you also to a library of practical tools that we um, curate and make um, free to the public um, through the Aspen Institute website. Um, and then have the, the practical information is also going to come, I'm going to give four very, very brief case studies illustrating how community-based organizations, higher ed um, institutions, um, government agencies and workforce intermediaries can work have some strategies that we've seen people taking from those lanes to strengthen jobs in their local labor markets. Um, we'll have some time for Q&A after um, Chris and I both um, speak, and um, I'm, you know, um, hoping that you, you know, have some some time to, you know, jot down your questions while we're while we're talking, so that we can, you know, be helpful to you at the end. Um, and uh, let's see, I'm going to start with the first slide. This is to get us started. Why are we talking about job quality today? And hopefully Chris doesn't have the same slide. Um, but nationally <laughs> for the last 25 years, uh, labor productivity has been rising. That's the dark, the dark blue line, meaning that for every hour of work that workers put in, they're able to produce more goods and services. Um, the American dream tells us if you work hard, if you're productive, you can build a better life for yourself and your children. But here we see with the light blue line that workers aren't really seeing the benefits of productivity growth in the overall economy. Um, the productivity has grown four times more than, than average pay has um, for workers. So workers' wages are not only just not keeping pace, they're really falling more and more and more behind as our economy grows and becomes more productive and workers are not, um, and not reaping the rewards of that, many, many workers. So, and, uh, there's a, and the next slide has another way of looking at these trends. Um, this is uh, major U.S. occupational groups in 2018, which was, of course, before the pandemic. Um, and what it does is each of these blocks is um, the, a, a major occupational category. The, 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 the average, I think it's average, might be median wage. Um, I can't remember. Um, yeah, median annual wage for that occupation and the numbers of jobs. And the boxes are roughly sized so you can see how big the occupation is in the labor, in the U.S., total U.S. labor force. 
The pink line in the center um, shows the living wage across the U.S. It's a highly generalized statistic. What it takes for two working adults and two children if both are working. So each adult needs to be earning 33573 um, to be able to support a family of four. Um, you'll see that below the pink line, we have many occupations. 36% of employment in the U.S. does not pay that. Um, and above the line, 64% does. So we have roughly, you know, to, to, you know, 35 to 40 percent pre-pandemic of employment in the U.S. not paying enough um, to live on, um, with two work, two two wage workers in the in the in the family and two children. Um, these jobs in the blue boxes are also they also include some jobs that are growing very quickly. Um, so things like personal care attendants, things like sales, retail jobs, um, food preparation. That's fallen off some in the pandemic, but one we would anticipate it growing again. So you can see that there's just this disconnect between um, the, what the, the labor force and what it takes to live in the U.S. Um, the next slide shows that um, there we have, of course, you know, the stark reality that the burden of low wages isn't borne equitably in the U.S. Um, because of systemic racism and occupational segregation. Workers of color, and particularly women workers of color, are very overrepresented in the lowest paying jobs. So you can't really talk about erosion of job quality without also talking about race and gender equity in the U.S. And you can't really address job quality without centering equity if you're concerned about um, really improving um, economic um, opportunities for many Americans. Um, so wages are only are, are one very important element of job quality, but they're correlated with a lot of other elements. So workers who earn low wages tend to have fewer benefits. They have less access to paid leave. They have less stability in work. And, and, and a lot of times they're, they don't have so much voice in the work. Um, so that's a, you know, a, a real issue in terms of job quality. Um, and I'm part of a team, we can go to the next slide. Um, I'm part of a team within the Aspen Institute's Economic Opportunities Program called the Workforce Strategies Initiative. And my colleagues and I have been, uh, well, I in particular have spent more than 25 years going on 30 focused on workforce development. And for most of that time, um, the team has focused a lot on what we call um, build ladder strategies. That's the, the things over on the right hand side on this graphic, um, using training and career pathways, looking at <clears throat> strategies that help workers gain skills and, uh, excuse me, and, and improve and improve their economic mobility through skill building and, and education. But even prior to the decade, but especially in the last decade, there's been a real increase in the rates of high school graduation and college attendance and in job training strategies that actually are better aligning with industry demand. There's been a lot of, a lot of great work done in, in, that, in, that, in that area, but increases in educational attainment and skills haven't done enough um, to raise earnings um, or lead to better jobs for working people. There just really aren't enough stable quality jobs that people, you know, we can refer trained job seekers to. Going back to that slide where we showed that like 38% of the labor force, you know, the, the, the jobs don't pay enough. So in recent years, in our work, we've really expanded and um, put a kind of a laser focus um, on the issue of um, what we call raise the floor um, strategies, the strategies over on the left, which means looking at the jobs themselves, not only looking at the workers and thinking how do we help workers gain skills, but also how do we, how do, we do some assessment of the, of the work itself and come up with approaches that can work on um, on, on, on job quality. So because basically in order for someone to even be able, even if you really are only focused on career, and that's not a bad thing, focused on career advancement and skill building, um, people have to have basic economic stability to be able to do it and succeed in it. So most people are, most adults are working while they're also trying to train and get education. And a lot of the jobs that they're doing don't give them enough of a, of a solid floor um, to be able to participate and, 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 and persist um, in training and education programs. So when we talk about improving job quality, we're talking about raising the floor of jobs so that more jobs in the U.S. can provide basic stability for U.S. workers. Um, and so it's, and you'll see it's, it's more than just sufficient wages. It's things like, you know, is there um, access to transportation? Is there communication in the workforce? Do workers have benefits? Do they have um, supportive supervision? Um, is it lawful employment? Um, <clears throat> is, it, um, is it safe on the job? And that's, and of course that has become um, 
something that we're that we've been really looking at during the pandemic a lot. Um, so looking at safety issues and and um, and this isn't on there, but just also you know how does the work fit in with people's ability to get things like childcare? Um, is the schedule such that you can hold down the job and, and retain and retain the work um, and do it? So um, we can go to the next slide. Slide. There are a lot of different frameworks for defining job quality. I'm going to lift up just one more. Um, the job quality elements here kind of, in, it's more, um, gives you a sense of that it's on a scale, right? That there's um, some, that's in things like sufficient and stable pay, a predictable schedule, access to benefits, health insurance, paid leave, safe working conditions. Um, what, I, what I like about this framework is that it's got this continuum that with each element you can look at it from low to high so because we can't necessarily categorize every job as good or bad um, so it's helpful there are some jobs that are you know we would just say that's a bad job but there are a lot of them that they 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 have you know there's complexity of factors and also complexity of what individual workers need um, and what they're looking for so look, doing, doing job quality as a continuum kind of recognizes that and it also I think um, we've seen allows employers to kind of see well okay where are, might be some places where we could make changes we may not be able to make all changes but that we could make some changes that improve jobs so I'm going to talk a little bit to kind of put some um, Get, get to the practical so what do you do about this because it's not it's, it's very it is a daunting task it's a huge task and we've been um trying to um get the message out that this is a task for everyone from no matter what lane you work in what kind of organization what kind of work you do everyone from um, workforce development people to higher ed to policy folks to uh, people working in government um, there's just a role for for everyone, um, even just you know, in your own neighborhood, talking about job quality is really important to kind of start to help change that narrative around that, that this is all just about a bootstraps kind of a, you can get the education, you can you can do it because basically we, as we said, they're almost 40% of jobs, so you're not going to be able to do it. So um, I'm going to talk some about tools and approaches, and we can go to the next slide. And um, <clears throat> And that we have we have been curating a job quality tools library. Um, we've asked um, we've have a ton of folks have contributed um, tools that they um, that they use in their work. Um, for many of you, job quality may feel like old news. I understand that you are in a lot of you are in the trenches of trying to help um, veterans get work, and I'm imagining that you run up against um, a lot of challenges in that um, in terms of finding work that can sustain them. Um, and even if you weren't focused on the kind of the precarity of work before the pandemic, you're probably now even more aware of risk and instability facing workers, especially workers of color and the need to improve quality jobs. Um, we've, we're trying to help um, answer this question of like not why you should work on job quality, but also how. Um, so what practical steps can you take? And um, we've seen um, a lot of people doing a lot of things. So we've been to, in the library. We've been documenting their approaches and collecting tools. And the library has, you know, more than a hundred uh, curated tools and resources. And I encourage you to visit the library. Um, the website, the the uh, website is right here on this slide. Um, and we would be very eager to hear from you if you have more tools that you think um, we should consider putting in the library or resources. Since this is a work in progress, we're adding things all the time. Um, and the next slide gives just a map of the library. I want to tell you just a little bit about what's in there. Um, I'm going to quickly walk you through um, the sections to give you a kind of the sense of the steps that different organizations, like the ones in this virtual room, you know, are taking to work on job quality. So this is our virtual library. Um, and the job quality tools library is organized in five main sections. Um, the one is around um, understanding job quality. It includes definitions and readings about what job quality is, why it's important. Um, probably has a lot of food, does have a lot of food for thought for helping um, people to have conversations about job quality with others. Um, give some talking points. Um, the uh, some of our we've we've also had uh, local partners that we've worked with. They use these um, definitions to develop local or regional job quality standards, um, things that or norms that they're trying to establish among people working together to help um, low income people get into work and encouraging local employers to improve their practices. Um, the second section is assessing job quality in organization in an organization. That could be for your own organization and your own workers, your own workforce, um, or 
working with other organizations where employers where you're trying to help people um, get work. Um, this is this is a, this is a, a section that has tools like the there's the working metrics, which is a software tool that help that has a, a way for employers to enter data about their retention and um, uh, excuse me and they, and um, and also salary and change in salary over time and get a score to indicate how their retention earnings benefits access and things and diversity um, compared to the industry peers. Um, you may discover that many of the businesses in your local labor market um, offer jobs that don't meet all of your job quality criteria, um, especially um, when you're talking about jobs that are accessible to people who don't, who don't have a lot of experience or who, who may not, in particular, experience. Um, and you'll ask, you know, how do I support employers to pr um, change their practices? And so Section 3 um, has a, lot, set, a number of tools that help you engage um, with employers, help you build capacity actually to in, to engage with employers in conversations about job quality. Um, you can use there's a back of the envelope cost of turnover calculator that you can use kind of even informally with an employer when you're talking about like so what do you what do you know about why people leave the job um, and how much does that you know cost you and many times employers have a sense but a lot of times. They don't know. They're not thinking about all the costs, and so the, the the calculator can help you with some of the things to ask about um, in terms of ways that turnover due to job, low job quality really hurt the business. Um, and once you've um, started talking about job quality with an employer, you might be trotting over to Section Four um, and looking at a range of tools that are designed to um, it's the largest section in the library, and it's. A lot of tools to address specific elements of job quality. So if you're hearing from frontline workers that they've had bad experiences with their supervisors, you might refer to an employer to some of the management training tools that are in this section. Um, that's a very common um, problem with, with turnover, cause of turnover, and, and many times people don't know that. Um, employers don't know that. Um, and there are tools for that. Um, and that's just, just one example. You'll see there's, you know, there are tools about scheduling, benefits, equity and inclusion. Um, but I'm going to move on to section five, which is monitoring improvements in job quality. And uh, some of you may be um, involved in monitoring um, employer and accountability um, to improve job quality. For example, some community groups have come together and they're monitoring um, community benefits agreements, like during real estate development, um, the large local real estate development projects where there are hiring requirements. Or, and so there are tools in here um, in this section that can help um, to hold employers and developers and investors accountable um, for the promises that they've made in, in return for things like tax abatements and zoning changes and infrastructure that's been invested in on their behalf. So that there are tools for monitoring the quid pro quo that they promised um, in terms of job quality um, in Section 5. So that was a lot to throw your way, but I wanted to kind of get through that so you'd know what kind of resources we have that may be helpful to you. Um, but we can go to the next slide. Um, I want to get a little more concrete. Um, I'm going to check the time. Sorry. Okay. About um, how these job quality tools and approaches might apply to you. I'm going to share just a couple quick case studies that illustrate why and how we've seen different organizations um, engaging employers and strengthening jobs. Um, so I'm starting with community-based organizations because I understand there may be a, a lot of people on the, on the, in the group who are with CBOs or are actually on the front lines of workforce development. Um, in Cleveland, we have worked with Towards Employment that works on, they, they work on connecting people to careers, um, and they work with a lot of young people. They have a fair amount of work that's tar targeted to young people, um, not youth. They, they do, I think they do work with high school, but we're talking about young adults. Um, and they realized that the jobs that they were sending young people into, even jobs in the same sector and the same occupation, but they varied a lot from business to business. So the employment practices of one retailer or one small manufacturer in the, for the same kind of work would vary a lot and that they're, the people they were you know, providing training to and, and helping them get placed in, into work were having really different experiences. Um, and you know, the, some of them were having very high stress, high turnover jobs, and others were you know, having supportive experiences where they were getting ex, you know, good experience and, and, uh, you know, and some mobility in the work. So, they understood that they had to um, 
that when people have, when someone, they learned actually, when someone has a bad experience at work, they, they can just fall out of the labor market. They may not go back. Um, and they wanted to figure out how they could get more discerning about identifying employment opportunities. So maybe, you know, before even thinking, how might I get an employer to change? First of all, ask, you know, how might I not work with those employers anymore? How do I figure out, like, who do I say no to? No, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fill that job order for, you know, five people because they've all left in, in the last, you know, four months. And so they, they, so this, what they developed was a question bank, um, which is full of questions to ask an employer about the workplace. Um, it, it's got questions about, you know, how, and, and it really has a lot of guidance on how to have a polite, respectful conversation with the business and ask questions that maybe you haven't asked before. Um, one of my favorite questions of all times is, what do you know about why people leave? Um, and that can, that can be an enormous conversation starter that's from a pretty um, neutral space. Um, and so basically they, the folks in Cleveland said when they saw their, um, when they started using the question bank, their workforce staff, they really started to see um, a change in actually the attitude of the providers on the front lines of the work feeling more empowered, feeling that they had more standing, feeling that they had um, uh, the, 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 the mandate, um, right, to actually step in and ask questions about a workplace environment and, and give some a pass. And maybe it's not a permanent pass, maybe it's a pass and say, this, is, this has been a problem for folks that, you know, that we've, that we've placed over here, or you don't have this or that, um, and it open, leave the door open to come back and have another conversation, but alerting them that this is an issue and it's been noticed. Um, so that, that's, that's in, you can find this question bank in, in section three of the library. Um, I'm gonna, the next um, case is about a higher education organization and how they've worked to strengthen job quality. And um, you can go to the next slide and it may be a delay, but um, the question of how higher education organizations can strengthen job quality is, you know, it's not unrelated to how a CBO um, can, can go about it. It's, um, I, there's some parallels. Um, they're both about strengthening relationships and really deepening the conversation that you're having with the employers you're working with, with the partners and, or partners to be. Um, something we've seen with community colleges that the staff don't always feel like they have the standing um, to challenge an employer about job quality or about their plans. So they're being asked to develop a training program or in this case in Chicago, apprenticeship programs. Um, and there's a tension because you, everyone's afraid the employer is just going to walk away. Um, that, you're, that you've got a bird in the hand, they're talking to you. But in fact, um, asking questions about benefits and starting wages and whether there's a wage progression, whether that's all built into it and sharing with them that you've seen success um, with apprenticeship and people retain the work and stay on the job, um, that that's, that's information that, the, that is helpful to the employer. And so it's coming from the right place. And certainly um, anyone providing a service to an employer does have standing to ask questions um, about what the workforce, what the workplace is like. Um, so we've worked with, um, actually this report that, I'm, that, that the tool here is with, from New America. The New America, we've also worked with City Colleges of Chicago. So but this, this tool is based on their work with, with um, youth and young adult apprenticeship. And um, it's based on, they've been doing ongoing work to help promote equitable access to apprenticeship and work-based learning. Um, so essentially they've um, been trying to promote higher standards in apprenticeship, um, City Colleges of Chicago is, in terms of getting more moving on a path toward registered apprenticeship, getting more moving on um, to a path that the, that the, you know, the wages, wages are transparent, hours are transparent, employers paying, you know, costs of training in college and books and transportation. It's very clear how many hours they're going to get. There's a clear wage progression. And a registered apprenticeship has all of this baked into it. Um, but so they're trying to, based on the successes that some of the companies are having that are, that are more robust apprenticeship programs and have higher job quality because apprenticeship is a job, um, then, then that's, that's, what they're, that's what they're trying to show. And so this is a very interesting, a very interesting set of tools if you're um, interested in um, like reading about how just kind of this process of working with employers, try, trying to get them to, to reassess what they're thinking about um, in terms of what they want, what they think they're going to offer as an apprenticeship, even an internship. Um, I think it could also apply. Um, and I am probably, I'm getting close.
Um, so my, this is how government agencies can strengthen job quality. And some of you are probably with government agencies. Um, what can you do to strengthen job quality? Um, I want to share an example from Seattle that's focused on both um, racial equity and job quality. Um, as we know, they're very in interconnected. Um, in 2004, so a long time ago, the city of Seattle launched a race and social justice initiative. This was one of the very first local governments in the efforts in the country um, focused on addressing re institutional racism. Um, and as part of the work, the city developed a toolkit, um, which, we, which is in the toolkit library in section four. Um, and the toolkit was designed, is designed to help city agencies incorporate um, racial equity analysis um, into their daily practices of government. So a clear place where they want, where they knew they wanted to start was the budgeting process. Um, so since 2004, every time a, any Seattle city agency has wanted to add funding for a program or an initiative or to add staff or, or to eliminate positions, to move funding, um, they're required to analyze the race and social justice impact of that um, proposed change. And um, they're asked to think about unintended impacts of the change, who will benefit, who will be burdened, and to take a number of steps um, to get community engagement that focuses on the people who are most who are likely to be impacted by the decision. So what does this have to do with job quality? And um, we saw it during COVID. Um, when COVID hit, the city had a really drastic reduction in revenue, um, had, like many cities, um, had to make budget cuts. Um, and they were already in the practice of doing racial equity analysis. Um, so it helped them to recognize that in the last recession, 2008, they had laid off, the people who they had laid off the highest rates were people of color, and particularly they learned black women. So in this budget shortfall, the toolkit prompted them to approach layoffs really differently. Um, and the last time one of our staff spoke with them, they were working on a new tool um, really to specifically to work on with layoff decisions um, based on what they've been learning about this. Um, so this toolkit is um, it's a great thing. It's been become a template for, I think, over 100 um, municipalities around the country. Um, and um, they, you know, they describe it in Seattle, um, the um, Marika Lockhart, Lockhart um, who's the office of their civil rights um, agency, you know, but she describes it as it's not just a tool, it's really become a set of embedded practice, it's, it's embedded into their practices. And so, but it is a, you know, a stop, are we thinking about this, you know, before we take the next step, um, how might this impact people? And then my very final thing is um, intermediaries. And I don't, a workforce intermediary is an organization that may make re-grants or um, um, be more of a, a convener or has a lot of different roles, but um, could be the workforce board. Um, and this example is from Central Iowa Works. Um, in Des Moines, um, Central Iowa Works is an intermediary. They're housed at the United Way, and they help their workforce partners connect employers with talented workers um, in jobs that are hoping to provide career growth and financial stability. Um, they recognize that small businesses in their area, like in a lot of places, are a really critical source of local jobs, um, and that many small businesses are invested in their workers. Um, they, they don't have as many, and they know them well. Um, they have very personal relationships with their employer, with their employees, and they want to, and they want to provide stable and supportive work, but they're busy, they're strapped. I'm, I'm here, right now it's really strapped. Um, they're operating usually with pretty tight margins. They don't have dedicated human resources departments, and they might not know where to start. Um, so um, Central Iowa Works used uh, their resources, and they engaged another partner, Pacific Community Ventures, and I'm going to call them PCV. Um, and P PCV has developed a Good Jobs, Good Business Toolkit, which is um, on their website. Um, and I think you can link it to it from our, um, from our library. Um, and they have business advising services. They have, um, anyway, they, they, they have a, co like a, a, a cadre of coaches, business advising coaches who work across the country. Um, and um, the, the toolkit provides some practical steps that small business owners can take to improve job quality. And, and it's very consciously thinking about ways that also improve business performance. Um, so the two organizations recruited five uh, small retail and service sector businesses in Des Moines. Um, that were interested in, in their job quality and trying to make and wanted to make changes and interested in job quality coaching. And they were provided with, um, you know, tools and coaching to think about, like, are there some low cost, light lift changes that they could make in their workforce practices that would benefit, you know, not only their workers, but also their business. And 
two of two of you know the last one they all started with the very the same first step they talked to or surveyed all their workers um, to understand their experiences their needs and to figure out not what they thought was you know the thing that needed to needed to be examined and, and thought thought through a little more or make a change but what the workers would, would, thought would make a difference for them and um, the coaching helped them to um, to kind of the, the coaches actually helped them figure out like how the conversation and there are also all tools in the in the tool book about it so um, but essentially trying to make sure that they're they're really addressing the things that the workers think are um, the things and 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 in and in, in, in all the cases although there are other things they all were interested in employee engagement helping people feel more connected to the work and supervisor and manager coaching which um, we see just everywhere supervisor coaching can be um, something that makes night and day differences in workplaces um, in terms of people being able to persist and retain in the work so um, I talked really fast I had probably too much but I wanted to give you a sense of the, the different ways that different types of organizations are working on job quality. So maybe some of you can see your lane in this, really eager to hear at the end if you have things you'd like to share with us that you're doing with job quality. Um, and um, we're gonna have time at the, at the end of the session. And if you wanna go to the next two slide after this one, the thank you slide, um, here's my contact information. You can also use your mobile phone and scan this um, um, QR code and it takes you right to our website if you'd like to get on our mailing list and you can enter your contact information. Um, so I'm going to stop and take a breath and um, thank you so much for, for listening if you're still with us and uh, I don't know if Cindy's coming back or if Chris is going to go over it. Follow me. I am back briefly. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, we have uh, quite a few questions that are coming through. We'll save those um, for the end with one exception only because I think we want to capture it now. You, you mentioned at the beginning that the job quality data that you were sharing was around legal employment. Can you just um, make sure you explain what you mean by legal employment? Somebody had a question about what do you mean by legal employment, just to clarify that before we move into Chris's question. If you're talking about the data that's in our slides, um, in the box slide that has all the different jobs and the numbers of jobs by occupation, that's Bureau of Labor Statistic defined employment. So it's not our definition of legal employment. It's the what's reported to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Perfect. Thank you so much. All mm -hmm. right. So, Chris, I'm going to hand things over to you. All right. Great. Um, thanks so much, uh, Amy. Um, that was fantastic. And thanks to you all for being here and uh, and hosting me. Um, so I am going to so that the, with the, the title of the session being, um, you know, promoting economic opportunity and job quality. Um, I knew that Amy was going to really uh, talk a lot about job quality. And so I'm going to focus a little bit more on economic opportunity, but within the context of quality jobs. And so, you know, just kind of want to preface this by saying that, um, you know, when I talk about uh, connections to work opportunities that embedded within this work is uh, a focus on job quality and a prioritization of quality jobs and quality employers. Um, and hopefully that'll become apparent and it'll, it'll dovetail really well as I kind of get into what I'm going to talk about. Um, but I, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what we know about the value of employment and earned income for people experiencing homelessness in particular, some effective models that we've used to connect people to employment who have had uh, difficulty accessing employment or who've been excluded from labor markets or excluded from economic opportunity, um, and uh, including models that have been specifically used with veterans experiencing homelessness. Um, and then talk about what, what those models can tell us and what the evidence tells us and how to kind of like frame up our approach to uh, connecting people experiencing homelessness to quality work. Um, so we can go ahead and move on here. I'll tell you just really briefly about my organization. Um, Heartland Alliance is a over 130 year old, um, fairly big uh, human rights and anti-poverty organization headquartered in Chicago. Um, Heartland Alliance does a lot of different things from providing health care, to providing housing, to workforce development, to um, refugee resettlement services, legal services for immigrants, um, international work, um, 
uh, and a wide range of other services. So um, a lot's going on within Heartland Alliance, um, but it's all focused on uh, anti-poverty work and human rights work. Um, and so where I fit into that, if we can uh, go on to the next slide, um, I work with our research and policy department um, and uh, here I'm representing the National Center on Employment and Homelessness, uh, which is part of our um, research and policy team here at Heartland Alliance. And uh, we're focused on making sure that everyone who is experiencing homelessness, who wants to work, has access to quality jobs in support of their uh, housing stability and um, yeah, helping people to exit homelessness and remain stably housed. Um, the, I think one of the things that's great about Heartland Alliance is that um, you know, we have a research and policy shop that's embedded within a direct service organization. And so a lot of our research and our policy objectives and our technical assistance and trainings and consultation and things like that um, are all really informed by uh, our staff members that are uh, working in direct service positions and most importantly the lived experience of the participants in our programs and so um, I think that that is a kind of one feature of Heartland that really kind of like positions us to do good work in this space um, so uh, we can go ahead and move on um, to the next slide and I'm going to just give you a little bit of a rundown about what we know about homelessness and employment. Um, and uh, and I'll also preface this by saying that, you know, we have a really kind of a, a big body of evidence that supports the value of employment and earned income for people experiencing homelessness. Um, sometimes some of these data have been used to justify policies that we don't really think are productive or effective. And so you might hear some of these same talking points, for example, being used in support of things like work requirements uh, for receipt of public benefits and things like that. And so, you know, I just kind of want to say up front that the evidence does not show that work requirements are effective in connecting people to employment. They're not effective in reducing poverty. They're not effective in helping people exit homelessness. Um, and so, uh, you know, we just want to acknowledge that those are not Kind of evidence-based principles um, and that we found that um, it's a lot more effective to provide supports and help people uh, access employment when they want to than it is to try to mandate or coerce um, or compel people to engage in employment activities when it's not their choice to do so. Uh, so I just kind of want to lay that out there up front because I, I've seen some of these same uh, you know some of these same data used for that purpose. Um, but we do know, first of all, I want to you know, acknowledge that many, many people experiencing homelessness already work. That uh, people working while homeless is a, unfortunately, a, a common, and common phenomenon, right? Um, and that the problem is not that people are unable or unwilling to work. The problem is that the available jobs don't pay enough to allow them to become and remain stably housed. They don't pay enough to help people meet their basic needs. Uh, and so that's kind of the, the fundamental issue that we're dealing with. There's this uh, profound misalignment between what work pays and what it costs for people to meet their basic needs, and particularly housing, but you know, basic needs in general. And so we just kind of want to acknowledge that like, we're not talking about helping people find any job because any job isn't gonna get people out of poverty. It's not gonna get people housed. Uh, we have to do better and we've never been interested in just kind of introducing people experiencing homelessness to the ranks of the working poor um you know and that we want we want more for for people than that um but we do know that there are a lot of positive um effects uh of employment and earned income um as it relates to to housing stability and exiting homelessness um you know, we know that people experiencing homelessness rank employment and earned income as one of their top priorities, along with housing and healthcare. Um, and, uh, and this aligns with kind of our, our value of consumer choice and helping people achieve the goals that they identify for themselves. Um, and, you know, some of these things should be pretty obvious to everyone here, but um, being employed is associated with um, uh, exiting homelessness more quickly um, and remaining stably housed. Um, it's also really important to note, uh, I think, for, for this audience in particular, that um, 
employment is actually uh, a protective factor um, for uh, people's experiences such as um, uh, recovery from uh, substance use um, uh, and mental illness. Um, and a lot of times, uh, you know, people who are working with people experiencing homelessness are concerned that employment is going to be a stressor and that the stress associated with employment is going to jeopardize people's recovery or that it's going to uh, interfere with their mental health treatment or you know exacerbate their symptoms or things like that uh, but we really know that the evidence uh, related to employment um, is that it supports recovery that it supports health well-being mental health that it can be a factor in helping people um, manage substance use disorder and, and, and other things like that. So we just want to, you know, and yes, employment can be really stressful, um, but I can say that, you know, I've been involuntarily unemployed in my past and, and many people here uh, have probably experienced that as well. And it is not without stress uh, to be unemployed. And so there are, uh, you know, a number of stressors associated with unemployment as well. And that employment is really important in helping to support people's um, not just help them meet their basic material needs, but it supports people's um, quality of life, their sense of belonging in a community. Um, it is, you know, for better or worse in our society, one of the key ways in which we identify ourselves and identify others. Um, when you meet someone for the first time, uh, a lot of times what you ask them, uh, the first thing you ask them is, what do you do? And so it, it's it's important to have that identity uh you know in our in our society and particularly for people who have been homeless um that identity as a worker is a a way of sort of reintroducing themselves to the community in which they're living um and kind of establishing that you know identity as a worker in their community so there there are a lot of um you know uh psychological and social benefits to to employment as well um and uh you know, I think that, um, you know, if I were talking to a, a room of, of, of uh, people in person that I could see, I might say, you know, of course, everyone here is only doing their work for the money, right? That, uh, you know, if you're in, in homeless services, that you're probably just in it for the big bucks. But there are, in fact, some other reasons for working, like, you know, personal fulfillment and a sense of contribution uh, that, that some people do get out of work. So you're probably somewhere there behind your computers uh, chuckling at that joke. At least I, I like to imagine that you are. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. Um, and I, I'm, you know, as I was, uh, you know, kind of thinking about um, the the talk today, and, and especially as I was, uh, you know, listening to, to Amy talk about job quality, it, it occurred to me that there were some things that I was going to talk about that don't necessarily show up a lot in my slides. Um, but I was like, oh, yeah, that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and, uh, and some of it is represented in this slide, which is just to acknowledge that what we're experiencing right now, even as economies are rebounding and jobs are coming back and um, societies are reopening, um, you know, that we're still very much in an environment that is impacted and defined by the pandemic. And, um, you know, so we're in a really strange time when it comes to labor markets, when it comes to how employers and job seekers are relating to each other right now. And so it's just important to acknowledge that that's still kind of a driving factor in, in, in how things are going right now in the world of work. Um, but, you know, some of the things that I think it's really important to acknowledge, one is that we had a highly inequitable set of um, uh, outcomes. Uh, in uh, from the pandemic and the way the pandemic affected the community um, that, you know, um, black, indigenous and people of color were um, adversely affected disproportionately in multiple ways by the pandemic. In addition to being, um, you know, more susceptible to illness and death, um, also, um, you know, black people, other people of color were more likely to have experienced job loss as a result of the you know, contraction of the economy. And the individuals who remained employed were more likely to work in sectors that had suddenly become really hazardous. Uh, and jobs that might not have been particularly unsafe uh, prior to the pandemic were all of a sudden uh, really unsafe. 
and uh, and and increased exposure to uh, to infection and disease. And so, um, you know, I think it's just really important to acknowledge that all the work we're doing now in workforce development and employment services, um, you know, should be in response to the racial inequities that kind of really blatantly played out um, uh, in the aftermath of, of the pandemic. Um, it's also, I think, really important to have a conversation about trauma. And this is what I was talking about when I said I was gonna talk a lot about stuff that wasn't in my slides. I wanna talk about trauma for a little bit. Um, because uh, as I'm sure, I, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and guess that most of the people uh, here um, are aware that the individuals that we're serving and that we're working with um, you know have experienced uh, in all likelihood multiple acute and chronic traumas in the course of their lifetimes right so lots and lots of trauma the chronic trauma of poverty and of homelessness and the acute traumatic events that just occur um, you know, as a direct result of experiencing homelessness, not to mention the kinds of traumas that people are carrying with them, um, you know, uh, possibly as a result of uh, their military service. And so, you know, we just have to kind of assume uh, that in every interaction and in every relationship that uh, the, the way people are sort of responding to us uh, is very likely a manifestation of the, the traumas that they've experienced. So. Why is that important for employment in particular? Um, there are a couple of reasons. One is that people who have experienced trauma have far worse workforce outcomes and employment outcomes than people who haven't experienced trauma. Um, uh, people who have experienced uh, multiple traumatic events are about 2.5 times more likely to be unemployed, for example. Um, and, uh, and people who are employed, um, a lot of times the, the kind of like natural and normal responses that they're having to their traumatic experience can be really problematic in the workplace, right? So like the ways people can respond to trauma, seeming dissociated or disinterested or detached, um, having difficulty concentrating, having difficulty following through on tasks, um, having sort of like disproportionate responses to things like, you know, anger and agitation, um, you know, in situations that might not uh, warrant that severe of a response, um, feeling as if they're being singled out or treated unfairly. Um, you know, there are just all of these ways that we naturally respond to trauma that are also the exact same things that will get you kicked out of an employment program or fired from a job. And so it's really important to look at um, you know, the, the responses of the individuals that we're working with and recognize that it's not just um, a lack of motivation to work. It's not a disinterest in work. It's not a lack of work skills. It's a response to trauma and we need to respond to it appropriately with trauma-informed principles. I believe this is really important, not just for service providers, but for employers. Employers need to hear this. Employers need to understand that a large portion of their workforce um, has experienced traumatic events and may be responding to that trauma. Not just people who've experienced homelessness, uh, not just veterans, but you know, something along the lines of like 60% of the adult population self-reports having at least you know like one traumatic event in their past. And so like a large portion of the workforce could be um, you know, not as successful or productive as they could be because their trauma is not being appropriately addressed by their employers and, and, and other, you know, um, parts of their life. So um, just kind of want to center trauma in this conversation. Um, I also want to just kind of point out that, um, you know, uh, the principles of trauma-informed care, when you think about how to apply them in the workplace, they directly correlate with principles of job quality. In some cases, they're the exact same thing. And so, um, you know, if you want to have a talk about how to respond appropriately to trauma in the workplace or in employment services, the, you, it, it automatically becomes a conversation about job quality. So Heartland Alliance um, has a program that serves um, young men who are at very high risk of engaging in uh, community violence. And it's a program that provides a combination of employment, immediate employment, transitional jobs, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and cognitive behavioral therapy and support services 
to help um, you know, both meet the immediate economic need of these young men and also to provide them with some cognitive tools that they can use to maybe respond differently in those high stakes uh, situations that might result in violence, right? We, uh, we conducted some focus groups with these, with these men uh, to find out what it was about the workplace that they, uh, you know, what did they want to see in an ideal workplace and what did they not want to experience in the workplace? Um, and these are uh, guys who have all experienced lots of trauma. So like 75% have lost someone close to them to community violence and almost 80% of them have themselves been victims of violence. A lot of them will tell you unsolicited, I'm suffering from PTSD. Um, so we asked them what they wanted out of a work experience and what they told us, um, you know, really closely aligned with both trauma informed principles and with measures of job quality. You know, what they said was they wanted to feel safe. They wanted a, a workplace in which they felt safe. They wanted a workplace in which there was mutual respect. Um, they wanted a workplace that was fair and transparent and in which they had some agency over what happened to them um, and in which they had, um, you know, positive relationships with their superiors and, and, and their coworkers. Um, and so, you know, and, and a lot of those are the same things that we talk about when we talk about job quality. So just kind of want to point out that that direct correlation there. Um, and so when you're thinking about connecting people to employment opportunities, um, you know, like looking at high quality employers and looking at measures of job quality, um, you know, uh, you know, there are a lot of reasons to do that, including the fact that it's less likely to be a traumatizing or re-traumatizing work environment for the people that you're connecting to jobs. So, okay, we'll go ahead and move on. I, I, I planned actually on being sidetracked a little bit there. So um, no worries. That was, I just, I decided that it was really important to talk about trauma for a while. Um, but there are a couple of uh, evidence-based models that have been used uh, to effectively connect people experiencing homelessness to work and, and, and have also been used extensively with uh, homeless veterans in particular. Um, the, the two strategies that have been most rigorously studied and shown the most uh, evidence supporting their use are transitional jobs and individual placement and support, or IPS. Um, IPS is sometimes referred to as supported employment. Um, so different terms for basically the same program model. Um, they are different in, in how they're implemented. Transitional jobs are subsidized employment um, opportunities. So uh, you offer someone a job with a subsidized wage right away, very low barrier, immediate access to work. Um, and that work can take place with a private sector employer that's getting a wage subsidy. It can take place in the public sector. It can take place in a social enterprise like a Goodwill. Um, but really what it is, is is providing someone with an immediate subsidized job and to couple that with supportive services to help um, them develop skills and be successful in work. Um, IPS is similar, but it's focused on placing people directly into competitive employment. Um, and so there's this rapid job search um, where, you know, an individual is really quickly introduced to job search and connected to a competitive uh, labor market job as quickly as possible, but there are these really intensive concurrent wraparound supports to help support that individual's success in employment. Um, these models have been used with slightly different populations. Um, transitional jobs have been more often used with um, uh, people experiencing homelessness, but also people who are returning home from incarceration or opportunity youth. Uh, individual placement and support has been really extensively uh, studied with people experiencing mental illness um, and substance use disorder. So they're, they're, they're um, but there are similarities. So if we just go to the next slide, um, what do these models have in common? So what can we learn? What are the kind of common factors? Um, one is rapid attachment to paid work, getting people into work really quickly, which I know runs counter to some of our instincts, right? Sometimes we think, well, people need to be stabilized in housing. We need to get their um, you know, uh, mental health uh, treatment in order. We need to make sure that you know, substance use isn't gonna be a factor in, in, in their employment barriers. We need to make sure that there are all of these other kind of supportive services in place and that the people are stable and then they can work. Um, but we found that really what's effective is getting people to work really quickly um, and then 
concurrently supporting them with uh, with the kinds of supports and skill development and other things that people need in order to be successful. Um, and it kind of makes sense because people have immediate basic needs, right? And people's you know instability in life is often the result of a lack of income. Uh, that, that doesn't allow them to, to meet their own basic needs. And so um, that, in, that connection to immediate employment can be stabilizing um, and it can help, you know, uh, you know kind of, um, you know, set them up for, um, you know, the ability to receive and participate in other services. Um, it's about low barriers. It's about, you know, in, in fact, IPS uses the term zero exclusion as one of their uh, core principles, right? Meaning that, you're not going to turn people away from programming. If somebody says they want to work, that we're going to accept them into employment programming and we're going to start the process of getting them to work. They might not be successfully enrolled in a, in a program tomorrow. They might not successfully enter a job tomorrow, but we're going to start the process now based on their stated preference, right? Um, and that, you know, once again, we can provide those services concurrently rather than as a kind of precondition uh, for employment programming. Um, and uh, and really just kind of acknowledge that, uh, you know, our values say that with the right supports, virtually anyone can be successful in work. Um, so let's just move on one more slide. I think I've got, um, you know, before I wrap it up. So uh, what this boils down to for us is um, using the principles of housing first and applying them to employment. So probably most people here are familiar with housing first uh, as a set of principles related to, to housing services, right? It used to be the case that, um, you know, uh, you know, well-meaning uh, professionals and individuals working within systems would make a determination about whether or not someone was quote unquote housing ready. And, uh, it, you know, um, if, if somebody wasn't housing ready, they wouldn't be connected with a housing intervention, but instead there would be other things that would need to be addressed, um, you know, before they were considered to be housing ready. Um, and uh, that paradigm is really almost fully shifted in the field of homeless services now, as I'm sure, which uh, means that if somebody wants to be housed, if somebody, you know, gives their stated desire to be housed, that um, that's enough they're housing ready when they say they are, and that it's a lot easier to help meet other needs that someone might have if they've already been stably housed. And that, um, you know, having like all these kind of like preconditions to housing um, isn't really effective in helping people to exit homelessness. Um, we take a kind of a similar approach to employment, um, meaning that, uh, you know, we're, we're really focused on consumer choice. If somebody tells us that they want to work, it's not our place to say, yeah, you know what, not yet, you're not really ready, you shouldn't be looking for work yet, because that's, you know, it's, first of all, it's kind of demoralizing and dispiriting for somebody who's decided that what they want out of their life is to get a job. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's also really just, um, you know, uh, kind of kind of unnecessary. Um, you know, we found that it's, it's really more effective if you say, okay, I hear you, you want to work, we're going to start this process right now. We're going to talk about the things that we can do today to set you on that path. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's acknowledging and responding to the preferences that somebody, you know, presents to us. Um, but this requires some, some almost like leaps of faith, right? Um, we have to have an assumption that everybody's employable. You have to believe that. You have to believe it on behalf of your participants. You need to actually hold the belief that virtually everyone um, in, in some way or another can participate in work and believe in the inherent employability of people who want that for themselves. Um, we also have to assume that people are motivated. Um, you know, when I, when I, we, oh, we hear about motivation all the time in the field of employment services, people aren't motivated, people don't wanna work. I'm having such a hard time getting my participants motivated to work. Um, and you know, honestly, if somebody shows up, in my opinion, if they show up, they've already demonstrated a high degree of motivation because they could have stayed away. They could have done anything else. If they presented to you and shown up and, and, and said, you know, I want to, I want to start preparing for work. Um, that could have, that just that, that act of showing up represents overcoming all kinds of barriers, overcoming barriers that in, include, you know, like the, 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 the fear of something new, a lack of confidence in their ability to succeed, all of the traumatic responses that they might be experiencing that are telling them stay away, um, you know, uh, all kinds of 
prior, you know, kind of um, negative experiences with other institutions and programs and community-based organizations and government agencies, right? So they've overcome a lot just to show up. And so we need to acknowledge and respect and celebrate the fact that they've shown up. And, um, and honestly, I, I really believe that, you know, if you want to talk about, um, you know, really succeed, helping people succeed in work, that the frame of motivation and that the frame of readiness are not really useful frames, that it's a lot more effective and productive to say, let's identify what your strengths are and build upon those. Let's identify what your barriers to employment are and remove or mitigate those barriers. And if you have this combination of focusing on strengths and removing barriers, concerns about readiness and motivation will take care of themselves. Um, and, uh, and, it, and it won't really be any longer be something that we need to concern ourselves with. Because honestly, it's really, really hard to assess for those things. You can't measure motivation and readiness. You just can't. They're not measurable phenomena. They're totally subjective. And it's not our place to make a decision on someone's behalf about whether or not they're motivated or whether or not they're ready. We have them tell us and we respond to them. So, um, sorry, I'm getting I'm getting on my soapbox a little bit now, which I tend to do. But um, hopefully, this is 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 kind of a useful perspective as well. Um, and it really is just about meeting people where they are. Um, a lot of um, tools that you probably already have in your toolkit are really really useful when it comes to employment. So there are probably many people here who already understand and apply things like change theory and the stages of change. Um, and it can be really useful when you're talking to someone about employment. If somebody doesn't want to talk to you about a job, they're in pre-contemplation and that's okay. Um, and our job is to talk with them and get them to the place of contemplation. It's not about making a placement next week. It's about meeting them where they are, understanding where they are, and working with them from that point forward. And so the other thing, other kind of like uh, clinical intervention uh, or method that I think is really useful in this context is motivational interviewing. Motivational interviewing and employment are um, an ideal match. Uh, motivational interviewing can be really, really effective in helping people to succeed in work. And that's an evidence-based practice. There's lots of, um, you know, research evidence showing, um, you know, the effectiveness of motivational interviewing specifically to help people deal with their ambivalence and fear related to work and actually connecting effectively to work. Um, and so, you know, obviously I'm out of time, so I can't tell you all about motivational interviewing, but it is absolutely worthwhile if your work involves connecting people to employment to get that, get that set of tools in your toolkit if it's not there already. Um, because there are all kinds of internal motivations, goals, desires, hopes, and dreams that people hold for themselves that can be facilitated by connecting to work and earning income. And just by asking questions and helping people think that through, you can really help them arrive at a point where they themselves are the driver and saying like, yes, this is what I want. I am motivated to succeed in work. Um, and, you know, as opposed to kind of like telling people, you know, what we think they should want or what we think they should do. Um, this also plays out uh, in um, how we connect people to employment opportunities and the kinds of employers and opportunities that we engage. Um, it's all about people's stated preferences, right? Um, find out, talk to people. You can use, you know, like career exploration assessments. You can just use one-on-one -on -one conversations. You can use focus groups or, you know, whatever. But find out what kind of work somebody really wants to do, whether you think it's realistic or not, and help connect them to something that aligns with those long-term goals. And if you do that, then, um, you know, rates of, you know, success and retention go way up. Um, just because you have, um, you know, 25 positions open at a local warehouse doesn't mean that anyone you're working with wants that opportunity or right? will be happy there. Um, and in some cases, those are the kinds of jobs that can re-traumatize people because, uh, you know, a lot of the experience of trauma is the loss of control. And a lot of jobs that, like, monitor people really closely and, like, track their movements and determine when they can and can't use the bathroom and stuff like that, like, not a really good match for somebody who's experienced uh, trauma, right? Because they, 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 give up too much control and agency, right? So um, 
helping to understand what people want and responding to those desires, even if it means more work for job developers and, and business service representatives and all those folks that already have like really hard jobs, right? I know, I know it's really hard, but like it can, it can really make a difference in people's success. Um, and uh, I'll just end with uh, one anecdote about that and then I'll, and I'll wrap up. Um, I was working, I was co-presenting with somebody who was a, an IPS practitioner um, who uh, had a participant who, um, you know, they were talking about what, what this person's employment goals were and they said, I want to be an airplane pilot. And this was somebody who was, you know, currently experiencing homelessness and mental illness and, and didn't have a GED. And, you know, your, your reaction to that position might be like, yeah, what do you really want to do because airplane pilot is just not on the table. Um, but instead of responding that way, what IPS will tell you to do is to, to follow it up with, what is it about being an airplane pilot that appeals to you? What are the, you know, kind of like aspects of that job that, you know, that, that you like? It turns out in this case, the person really liked the uniform, thought airplane pilot uniforms are like the coolest thing you could possibly wear on the job. And that person ended up getting a job as a security officer. Uh, wearing a uniform that was not unlike an airplane pilot's uniform and was happy and successful in that job. Um, and so, you know, just kind of one example, like it doesn't have to be exactly the right thing, but just to kind of like hear people understand what they want and and demonstrably respond to their preferences so that they understand that you're hearing them and that you're reacting to them and that you're taking their their preferences and their goals seriously. Um, so I've I've gone over my time. I apologize for that. We have free toolkits uh, and resources on our website. You can see the URL there. Um, and then finally, I, there's a, a slide with contact information. And you're all welcome to reach out to me with any other questions or if you're having trouble navigating our website, which is almost certainly going to be the case, um, I can help direct you to the resources that you're looking for. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Chris. So much great information that's been uh, shared uh, this afternoon. I apologize for the feedback that is coming from me. Um, that should be better now. <laughs> um, so thank you all so much for that. We do have some questions. We're gonna try and get through as many of them as possible. Um, this first question, um, it's a little long, but I'm gonna read it because there's so much context packed into this that I wanna make sure I capture it all. So um, the, the person who submitted the question that said, while working in the career center system, I've noticed that many of the people who qualified for WIOA training as low income could not access that training since career center services were only offered in person and during work hours. Since the pandemic has opened the door to virtual services, is there any push to pressure uh, is there any push or pressure being put on the career centers to expand hours in order to serve the underemployed? So I cannot speak to, um, you know, what's happening, uh, you know, with, you know, individual um, career centers across the country. Um, you know, so I, I really don't know, but I, I absolutely believe that there are lessons about accessibility to services embedded in what we've experienced in the pandemic that we need to respond to and, and build into, you know, um, the way we deliver services in the future. Um, and I know that some workforce boards and American job centers across the country are really looking at ways they can improve um, services, uh, like including using, using like, um, human-centered design processes, for example, um, you know, to kind of determine how they can make their services more accessible. But like, yeah, the the ability to connect um, remotely um, is like a a preference for some folks, and and definitely shouldn't go away once we have in-person uh, services available again. Amy, did you want to take that one as well? Oh, I think we've lost your sound. I think you're muted. You're self-muted. There we go. <laughs> Is that, am I back? You are back. Okay, I was trying to not breathe over Chris while he was talking. Um, I don't have. I also don't have kind of a bead on my finger on that, um, not tracking that. So I don't know the answer. But I would agree with Chris that this is um, a, at a moment in time when um, a lot of things that have been a problem for decades um, actually deserve 
some second looks and to think about what has what has been useful to people during that we learned about during the pandemic. I I would agree with that. Um, making service hours differently. And, you know, I think along the same lines, I would also say that there are some issues around job quality for people who work in a lot of workforce development organizations. And um, so I, I, I'm hoping that this is also a moment when we can look and see what heroic efforts um, workforce uh, folks with, you know, have put out during the pandemic to be able to pivot in ways that were um, truly heroic um, in, in a lot, in many places that I, you know, was tracking and, and talking to people. So, but, you know, there's a huge opportunity cost to a low, a low income person to be, have to do training during work hours, during prime working hours. Um, so it's just, I, I, I agree it's a big issue, but I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer. <laughs> No, excellent. I think it's that's right. We're, we're raising it. This seems like the prime opportunity to raise that mm -hmm. issue. So thank you both for that. Um, this next question, I think, is primarily for Amy, just based on the content, how you guys divided the content today. Um, you talked a little bit about, I think, when you were talking about Seattle and the whole budget analysis process and the impact of that. Um, and the question is really, Given all of the things that happened over the past year around equity and social justice and um, and the spotlight, has that um, has have the data points or the way the questions are being asked or who is asking those questions or how frequently has any of that changed and evolved that you've seen? Um, I know that was a, a specific case in Seattle, but there's the sort of like how has the last year's spotlight on racial equity? Um, impacted some of those things that may have before been more isolated? That's a great question. Um, if we don't measure things, we don't, you know, they don't happen. And um, I, I think that's a, that's a conversation we're in all the time trying to figure out um, how to do that. I, I don't have an answer for that question. I think so much is in flux. But what I will say is that I don't think too many definitely race equity and issues associated with racial justice are front and center in many, many more places than they ever were before and the start to many conversations about almost any topic in the in the space. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's not the same community to community, but we are, it's, I mean, I don't think we have a conversation anymore that doesn't have race equity centered in it, um, in the work that we're doing where we're going out and trying to, you know, track what, what folks are trying um, out in communities. So, um, I, I, it's a great question. I think stay tuned on that one because I, I'm hoping that we're going to be holding ourselves to the fire on this issue of metrics um, because we need better data um, to be able to know if, if we're actually doing any better in terms of um, of expanding um, or just breaking down um, some of the systemic racism that's 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 been at uh, at play in in too many places. Um, but anyway, sorry, I don't know the answer, but I think it's a terrific question. And Chris may have something to add to this, actually. No, okay. <laughs> Great. We've got lots of great questions. So the next one is a very sort of practical, tangible question that I think you can both answer in slightly different perspectives. But this is from a sort of a frontline employment specialist who agrees with what you're saying and the whole idea of job quality and all of the things that we've talked about, employment first. I'm going to use that sort of term for some of the things Chris talked about. But how do they convince their management their organizational agency management when they have metrics funded grant funded metrics that are not geared to that are much more geared to sort of numbers placements those kinds of things what do you think what advice would you give those folks do you want to go first chris or would you like me to um sure i, I can go um or, uh, uh, at least you know make an attempt i think that um you know, there are all kinds of ways in which, um, you know, the the performance measures used in workforce development, um, you know, are really, uh, you know, kind of not helpful for achieving the goals that we have for people who basically, um, you know, are going to have a little bit more difficulty connecting to work, who are going to take a little bit more time to connect to work, who need more intensive services. Um, in order to actually like implement some of these approaches that we that we think actually work so you know in order to kind of meet people where they are and 
um, you know, kind of like practice some of these strategies like motivational interviewing and to provide more individualized job development assistance and stuff like that. Um, you know, we need the time and the space to do it. And so, um, you know, performance measures, both at sort of like the workforce board level, for example, or what your, you know, particular agency might be sort of like using to evaluate your performance as, you know, an employment specialist or, or you know, whatever your role is, can be a hindrance to doing that. Like, I think it's absolutely correct that that can be a problem. Um, all I can say is that, um, you know, a lot of the agencies that I've worked with over the years that have done a really good job of serving people um, with more barriers to employment and, and successfully connecting them to work have really, um, you know, they haven't ignored their performance measures, but they've approached those measures in the context of the population that they're working with and the needs of those individuals. And so um, I, I think that there's a really strong case to be made for, for example, looking at um, some alternate or interim measures for performance. So like, um, you know, if you're only being evaluated on job placements, 30, 60, 90 day retention and wage increases, which is often the case, um, that, you know, that's going to provide you with, um, you know, some perverse incentives with regard to who you choose to serve and, and the kinds of services that you provide. So to look at things like other, you know, alternate measures that include things like um, you know, racial equity outcomes, for example, but also things like, you know, access to services, um, access to training, um, you know, uh, you know, kind of some of these sort of like process measures that we can introduce might be really good in, in helping to kind of like demonstrate your level of effort and your success without solely relying on numbers like placements. That was a great answer, Chris. Um, and I, I'll just add one thing because I would second all of that and um, especially that process measurement and thinking about interim things and things that demonstrate the work that you're doing to help people make progress. Um, I think we don't do enough of the progress measuring. Um, but, I, but I would also say that we've seen um, organizations actually challenge the, the metrics. Um, we've seen organizations, so for example, um, the San Diego, San Diego Workforce Partnership put out a um, regional, their, their annual, or I don't know how, I guess it's their annual um, plan for WIOA in the state of California addressed job quality and it was proved. And, it, you know, they, it gave them some flexibility around what they were going to be not only doing with the money that was passed through to them, but also how they were going to be assessing and, and reporting on what the work was. Um, and so there are, um, I, I I guess I would say at your, you know, if you're sitting on the front line, giving, thinking, you know, you probably have some ideas about how your work should be being assessed and where you feel you're making progress with participants. Um, and that would probably be very helpful, um, you know, to, to be sharing among yourselves, you know, thinking like this is, if these measures aren't reflective of what we do, which I agree with you, they're probably not. Um, then what, what are things that you think about when you think, you know, well, wow, we've really made progress here. Maybe you'd come up with a new metric, you know, and, um, and something that, that makes sense for your context. Great, thank you. You guys are doing great on questions that are not easy, simple questions to answer. So we appreciate that. And we appreciate these great questions from the audience. Um, the next question is a very sort of practical, tangible question. And it's primarily, I think, for Chris around the IPS model and the subsidized, um, the transitional work model you were talking about. And the question is, you know, have, have you found or the folks that you work with found that there are certain mental health situations where at least medications stabilizing needs to happen before somebody could could work and work steadily. So you know this this is something that we've um, you know we've really struggled with in a very practical way in the implementation of some of our programs at Heartland, and I've also talked to you know lots of um, you know professionals and leaders from around the country that have kind of grappled with similar questions. Um, I can say that in the case of IPS in particular, um, you know, the, the kind of designers and the kind of um, the people who monitor and evaluate fidelity to that particular model um, are, you know, really committed to zero exclusion. Um, and so from that perspective, like, there's not any sort of like, you know, kind of condition or barrier that somebody could present 
that would exclude them from services. Um, that's not to say that there aren't some things that might need to be addressed or resolved before that per person can be sort of like fully successful, but it means that they're not sort of like turned away or dismissed out of hand for, for, for experiencing those barriers. And IPS in particular uses a multidisciplinary team of wraparound support service providers that include mental health uh, uh, providers. And so it might be the case that um, you know, they, they'd enroll in the IPS program, but that one of the really immediate services that they're receiving in conjunction with job search would be that like mental health care. Um, but um, yeah, you know, I mean, there, there have been instances, for example, in, in Ready Chicago, um, in which the, the people that were providing the employment services have felt as if it was beyond their you know, kind of capability to, to address somebody's substance use or mental health needs. Um, but, you know, that's, I think, you know, a matter of program design, but like in, in principle, and I think the IPS folks are really good at doing this, is they, they have, you know, this kind of really sort of like steadfast tenet of not turning people away. Great, thank you so much, Chris. Sorry, I again have my echo issue. So our next question, and let's see if I can. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. There we go. I think I got my I got my echo. Uh, um, the next question. Um, Let's try that, that's better. The next question is around responding to trauma and some of the trauma issues that were brought up. And it's about how do you address, the, it's sort of a two part. One part is what's the impact or have you seen impact um, of COVID on sort of expanding trauma or what that means? I know Amy, you talked a bunch about, or at the beginning about jobs that were were not hazard, hazardous that stayed around that suddenly became hazardous and th many of those were the lower wage lower job quality jobs but has that increased but then also how do you have a conversation with an employer around trauma um so that they can be better informed when they're hiring the folks that you're trying to get get jobs for I guess um, I want I would want to make sure there's time for Chris on this one because I don't have my own pers as much personal direct research experience on this, but I am going to try to put a, a link in the chat um, because some of my colleagues um, have done some work um, with uh, Youth Build Philly, um, which has a very um, very strong focus on trauma informed management practices and does actually training for managers and supervisors in employment contexts, um, as well as within, you know, they have, they're, they're also a, um, a school um, and a program for, for young adults. So um, I'm not going to, I'm just going to not take time on this one because it's just not really my, my expertise, but I will, I will see if I can figure out how to put a link in the chat because there's a great paper that has a lot of detail on, on, on the practices. Um, yeah, I would I would say also that um, there was a paper that a colleague of mine and I did some contribution to uh, that was um, produced by the National Fund for Workforce Solutions uh, recently on this topic, and I too will see if I can track it down um, and include it. Uh, but um, I also have done a little bit of work with a project in Chicago with Heartland Alliance that was called Onboard Chicago. Um, that was it's sadly not continuing right now but um was focused on direct employer engagement related to trauma and uh you know trying to help um you know build trauma informed principles into frontline management with with various local employers um we were able to really get a lot of interest from employer partners uh you know just by making a basic pitch to them saying like look um, you know, a lot of these, you know, kind of, um, uh, you know, problems that you're seeing with uh, worker performance, um, you know, could actually very well be responses to trauma. And, you know, just kind of give them some of the statistics, you know, like 60% of the adult workforce 
um, you know, self-reports trauma, and that's probably really low because it's self-reported. And that all of the issues like things like frequent illness and absenteeism, you know, like behavioral challenges in the workplace, um, you know, people, you know, having, you know, like challenges with, you know, kind of like following through on tasks and things like that, all of them very well could be related to trauma. And so if you're, you know, interested in improving the retention and performance of those workers, then taking a trauma-informed approach might be really useful for you. And when presented with that information, we had like actually really positive response from a a handful of employers that we engaged in Chicago. And so I know just anecdotally that that kind of messaging can be well received by employers, particularly employers that are already employing people who are, you know, like entry level uh, workers and people who have prior justice involvement or may have been homeless, that they're really interested in supporting the success of those folks. Terrific. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the time and I think we have time for one more question maybe and then I'll let you each have a closing um, a comment um, to leave us with but this question is uh, for both of you and it's around funding um, you know is there sufficient funding at the federal level primarily but also at the state and local level for employment programs and specifically the kind of employment programs that we're talking about um, for folks um, or does you know the this current capacity, um, is current capacity fine or do we need more of these programs? Um, and what would you say to that? And I, I know both of you probably have thoughts on this one. I, I'll start. No, there's not sufficient funding in any way, shape or form at any level of government. Um, and I will say that for, in two ways. One is that we are doing a um, real, much of our programming, first of all, it's just not enough and it's been declining. I think it's, in the last 40 years, it's, I don't remember the percentage, but if there's, if there's a chart out there somewhere that shows how workforce funding has declined over the last 40 years. There are two things going on. My, one is that there's just less funding. The population is growing. Job quality is declining. Um, there are more and more people who just need services and we can't give them. There are very, there's very little um, service for people whose who English is not, first, not their first language. Um, much less worrying about cultural appropriateness or cultural, you know, sensitive um, work for people with from with different backgrounds. Um, there's the other issue is that a lot of funding comes through as um, initiatives uh, rather than just funding that just needs, you know, that's passed through. This is your base funding. You get this amount. And here, you know, we here are your goals or you give us your goals. And instead, there's a lot of like initiatives. We're going to show that this strategy works and we're going to, and communities are pitted against each other in competition for the, the initiatives. They're time limited. They've got, you know, you have to, anyway, they're, they're, it's, um, I feel like that has become, um, rather than being used sparingly as a learning and motivational kind of approach to spreading innovative practice or, or trying to seed change in innovative practice and learn from something and, and, as a demonstration should be. It's been more, this is our, these are our flagship programs and it's, there's just, there, there just can't be enough um, when, you, when you do that kind of competition. And it, and, it, and it erodes what goes on, what we need to have happening in communities, which is a lot more collaboration across organizations. Um, so when, when, when several organizations from the same community are all putting in proposals for the same, um, you know, funding, you know, funded initiative, that's not helpful um, because, and, and just mandating people to collaborate, that's not helpful either. Everybody needs to have a base, you know, all the organizations that have got, you know, proven that they've effective in their, in whatever way it is, in their different ways, um, there, there should be some floor of funding that people can count on so they can plan. Um, so that they don't have their own terrible staff turnover, so that they don't have, you know, so many, I'm on a soapbox right now, but no, there's not enough funding, and there's especially not enough funding for the kind of work that, that needs to be done if you're going to think about job quality and engaging with businesses. So there's not enough to work with participants in the intensive way that needs to happen to really serve them well, and there's also not enough to engage with the business, which is actually also a constituent, um, and, but, the, but, but instead of, rather than just saying, I serve you, there needs to be funding to help like, people develop their tools and their skills and their staff and their standing and their confidence to be able to say, and here's how I will. That also is of benefit to my primary constituency, which is the job seeker. So I'll stop. <laughs> 
agree 100 <laughs> percent I had a feeling there might be some strong feelings on that question. So looking at the time, I think we have time for just a, a quick sort of final message from either of you. Um, Chris, do you want to go ahead and go first? Um, well, I, I haven't really prepared a final message, but I would just, um, you know, like to say that, uh, you know, you have my contact information that uh, the National Initiatives team at Heartland Alliance um, has a lot of free resources for you and you can feel free to reach out to me directly with any further questions or if you're seeking additional resources or information uh we'd be happy to help and thanks very much thank you chris amy thanks chris um i will say um i'm very very delighted to be here uh, many of you have, who started have stuck with us the whole time. I'm excited that you're interested in job quality and working on job quality. I will echo Chris and say, please, please, you know, reach out. We'd love to be helpful. We also have a lot of resources that are free for you to use. And we'd love to hear, really love to hear about your experiences um, implementing strategies to improve job quality. And um, I will also say that um, I think that the most the folks that I've seen be most effective out in the field working on job quality have really approached it with some real baby steps um, and have just started, you know, kind of thinking, first of all, what do we mean by this and what's something we can do that's manageable? How do we just start this conversation? How do we let people know this is a concern? And, and then over time, you know, start to see, you know, opportunities from where that, what their lane um, for ways to either, you know, advocate for policies in their community that, that are, about, you know, help job quality or with, from within their own work that they are promoting job quality by keeping it an issue, you know, front and center all the time. And so um, I'm just delighted to have been on this panel and thank you all so much. And thank you, Chris. You've been a great um, co-presenter. Uh, co co I really, um, I've never met Chris, so it's been really great to meet you and to hear about your work. Um, and I learned a ton. So. Thank you, and thank you, Cindy, for all the prep. Really appreciate it. Well, I just want to say to Chris and Amy, thank you both so much. This has been a great session full of so much information, so much food for thought, so much inspiration about what can happen. And I know you can't see the, the chat um, the questions that folks are come, sending in, but I can. And we've had quite a few who have just said, thank you both for all that. This is, what to quote one, this has been a simply great presentation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So with that, I'll say thank you both. Everyone, thank you for joining us for this session and we'll see you at three o'clock for the next session. Thanks everyone. Thank you so thank much. You.